Leave it 5 one turn right heading 180. 1 4 Papa, turn right 245, report localised established 27. Welcome back to the sixth and now second to last episode to the 737 MAX series here on the channel. Despite certain videos being blocked from recommendations, making also next to nothing from the series itself, I did want to try and attempt to finish it and appreciate all of you that have tuned into the videos so far. If you've missed out on any of the episodes, which is likely due to YouTube blocking some of the content from being seen properly, I would highly encourage you to check back on the channel and get completely up to speed. Today's focus, as the title suggests, is on the aftermath of the incidents and how Boeing deflected blame away from themselves, despite knowing the situation already. Again, despite the subject matter, I hope you find this video as interesting as possible. As we know, the 737 MAX has had inadequate testing, has seen countless faults brushed to the side, and when it started flying, already had issues present that were being kept from the FAA. So when the events of JT610 happened, it wasn't exactly the biggest shock to Boeing. But this isn't the perception that they gave, deflecting a lot of the blame towards the pilots of the aircraft alongside the FAA. This helped, in my eyes, push the narrative that the blame should have solely been on the pilots of the Lion Air aircraft, and helped have those that maybe doubted Boeing and were easily say let on to completely forget about the potential safety issues even prior to a thorough investigation that had taken place. While the FAA were aware of what Boeing had been up to after JT610, they didn't take this into account when it came to making a formal decision on whether to keep the 737 MAX flying despite the type going down. After JT610 and even ET302, for a significant period of time, the FAA seemed to blindly follow what Boeing was saying and blaming the pilots. If we track back to the days after ET302, the FAA was still hesitant to ground the type, believing that the series was still structurally and internally safe following the second major incident in a five-month period. Their stance still stayed exactly the same even after countless other regulators grounded the type. It was only as the public pressure continued to mount and reached ungodly levels that the FAA finally pulled the plug and almost seemingly reluctantly grounded the type. However, even when they did, they didn't necessarily cite the safety of the 737 MAX as the main reason for this. It's not a lie that almost all incidents also have an element of pilot actions on top of multiple other reasons. I say almost all because there are some that are specifically not the case. However, for Boeing and the FAA, with a known technical flaw already present, they, if anything, overemphasized the idea of pilot error with the events of JT610 and put to the side the MCAS. Boeing proceeded to put out a bulletin around a week after the incident, noting a little description about MCAS, but nothing to actually indicate the severity of it. They said, in the events of Aeronus AOA data, the pitch trim system can trim the stabiliser nose down in increments lasting up to 10 seconds. The nose down stabiliser trim movement can be stopped and reversed with the use of the electric stabiliser trim switches, but may restart 5 seconds after the electric stabiliser trim switches are released. However, the severity as you can see from this quote from the OMB alone was not in any way, shape or form enough to indicate just how bad it was to the public and also the customers and so on. The report also goes on to note the startle effect, which was not mentioned in this. The startle effect can be defined as muscle reflex, an increased heart rate, stress, headaches and other similar symptoms in the cockpit in the event of something similar to MCAS being activated. It is used to describe certain situations and could have especially been noted to signify the severity of MCAS in that OMB. However, it wasn't. This gave the general public the perception that if MCAS was activated, it was a relatively easy fix. Once again, that meant the pilots were the ones who weren't alert enough to fix a plane with its nose pitched down at a rapid rate. That's the, perce that's the perception we were given. It was only a day after Boeing issued this OMB that the FAA issued an airworthiness directive, something you may have heard me say on multiple occasions here in the channel. And this is issued when there is a problem with a part on an aircraft that needs fixing or addressing. Similar though to what I mentioned before with Boeing and their OMB, the airworthiness with the FAA left out any mention of MCAS. The airworthiness focused more on the AOA sensor, noting, this emergency AD was prompted by analysis performed by the manufacturer, showing that if a high single attack sensor input is received by the flight control system, there is a potential for repeated nose down trim commands of the horizontal stabilizer. 
This airworthiness caused a lot of controversy with a number of people heavily disagreeing with how it was issued. I want to cover now what a senior officer at the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society said. She said, The Emergency Airworthiness Directive, AD, was clearly insufficient for preventing the second accident of the 737 MAX. While the AD addressed the issue of blocked AOA sensors affecting aircraft performance, it did not address the MCAS by name, nor did it explain how MCAS used the sensor inputs to control the aircraft's pitch, leaving pilots with an insufficient mental model of MCAS in normal and abnormal situations. More importantly, it failed to mandate training on the MCAS, on correctly identifying problems with improper MCAS operations and on proper procedure execution. On November 12th, the storm surrounding MCAS and Boeing began. It was following a MOM being issued, which is a multi-operator message, which was sent out on the 10th of November to all customers of the 737 MAX and NG models. This alerted customers to MCAS, and for many, was the first time in which they found out about it. The MOM, though, was not kept secret for long, and on the 12th of November, and in the days following, news outlets around the world began running multiple stories indicating that due to this revelation, Boeing were withholding crucial safety information from their customers, the FAA, and more. After 12 days or so of the narrative being pushed that the blame should be on the pilots of JT610, despite a proper investigation not being held, the attention shifted quite rapidly towards Boeing and their MCAS system, and what they had to hide. Since this point, the attention surrounding MCAS has been relentless, and the second incident that had take place in March of the next year did not help them by any means. As the scrutiny continued to pile on Boeing, they continued to prove that while there may or may not be issues present, they not once ever violated the FAA's regulations. Finding ways to word faults with the MCAS and or the AOA sensor so that it wasn't as severe as it truly was. This was a gamble of the safety of all passengers boarding the aircraft and to allow the jet to continue flying which was included in the same gamble. These findings of the report that I've mentioned throughout this video highlight the FAA's lack of intent to get to the bottom of MCAS in the early stages, which played a crucial role as to why the events of ET302 were even allowed to happen in the first place, as well as Boeing withholding crucial things from the regulator and their customers that could have better aided the pilots in the situation of JT610. That's going to conclude now. The second to last episode on the 737 MAX series, focusing on the post-accident report. Thank you very much for the continued support. I really appreciate everyone that continues to tune into these videos. The next episode will be the final one. It'll be covering a couple of the other problems that the 737 MAX faced that were not related to MCAS. And then from there, what I'm going to do is pretty much wrap up the entire report, go over the findings, and really conclude and put a nice closure on the topic. Thanks once again. If you have any thoughts, do not hesitate to drop them in the comments below and continue that dialogue that I know people have been having and that I've seen. I will see you all in the next video. Take care and stay safe.